Uh, over here, Susanna Elliott. Oh, this is a bit of a cheeky question. Oh. Yep. Um, a bit of a cheeky question, really. Uh, do you think with um, biomedical that we'll ever get to a, a situation where we've got to do positive reinforcement the other way? In other words, <laughs> you know, to, to get more men into the field. And how would you do that? Positive reinforcement for men in the medical sciences, <laughs> yeah. is that...? Well, it's a, it's, it's a possibility. I think that uh, we, we're still to see how the trajectories pan out. Uh, at postdoctoral level, where you still have this imbalance of women not being able to get um, as far as fast uh, as men. But uh, um, that might be a, an important issue to face. Um, quite an interesting one. It's a little bit comparable. We're already seeing this. I'm sure it's the same in Australia. In the UK, um, at uh, primary school teaching, is very heavily female dominated, and people are saying that we need more men as male role models for the next generation. And nursing and, as well. And nursing, yeah. So there's issues already in other sectors, yeah. um, and I'm sure it, it may well be the same. But again, my views on positive discrimination are unchanged. But they are offering positive um, uh, discrimination for primary school mm. male teachers, actually, yeah. aren't they? Mm. Anything to add, Marie? No, well, I, I said nurses. <laughs> <laughs> OK, nurses. good. Thank you. <laughs> uh, down the front here. Hi, uh, Chris Evans from the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute. Um, I was just wanted to follow up regarding positive discrimination and um, reflect on a publication that Nature put out this week, which looked at um, the number of Nature reviewers, editors, uh, commissioned pieces that were by women, and they found that um, they self-reported that they had um, asked less women to be guest editors, less women to be reviewers, and that their solution was a form of positive discrimination, was that the editors were to say, well, who are five? And I could ask to do this job. And I guess my, my comment says is, well, my, my question is, if you want to have the most able person in the job, yet we've shown that unconscious bias discriminates how we judge able, how are we just going to make sure that the women are still in... Can we use positive discrimination to make sure women are in the pool to be selected from in the first place? That's a, a very good question. Can I just qualify that I, I've actually got the paper here and the area that Nature was uh, talking about was in their news and views section. Um, it's not in the peer-reviewed section. Um, Susan, did that report surprise you when you saw Again, it? Again, it didn't surprise me. Um, it depressed me, because on the whole, all of us do this. We tend to favour people that are just like us. Whether, you know, they look like us, and the same age as us, and the same gender as us, and so on. Um, now there, I wouldn't call it positive discrimination if one policed and really made a great effort to ensure that if there's a choice between a male and female reviewer, then the female is, is selected. You know, that for me wouldn't be positive discrimination any more than when I was um, doing admissions at Oxford and we had two equal candidates, one from a disadvantaged background, one from Eton, I would take, of course, the disadvantage. Now, I wouldn't call that positive discrimination. It's just trying to keep the playing field level. level. That's very different from ring fencing or, or biasing and taking a less able person over a more able one. But isn't it, uh, in the very public end of science, important to have the female voice, which is essentially what nature was saying, yeah. sorry, we haven't been doing that. Yeah, yeah um, I, I agree with Susan on what she said. Um, mm. And, and what Fiona's been saying as well, just about when uh, nurturing female talent as well. And um, the way I see it is, with any job, when someone gets into it, there is a time when you need to learn the skills, learn all the tricks of the trade. And, and I think a, a woman and, or a man could be taught those tricks and have that mentoring to be brought up to scratch. I think the other thing in that article was that women need to actually... Um, the, 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 there was some interpretation that women might have less time to actually review and might reject reviews more. So what we have to do with our mentoring and, and the, the sort of networking is to encourage women to, to actually try and do it, you yeah. know, so they don't let people down and that they really do play their part in uh, doing that reviewing and, that, uh, and that, those sorts of activities, because I do think it's very important. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. It's partly, let's say, you know, the women are sometimes not very assertive, they don't push themselves yeah. forward, they don't let themselves be known. Yep. Yeah, so I think, yep. you know, the onus is on us as well to show that we're there, you know, to make it clear we're happy to volunteer to do these things and so on. Uh, because there is a pool of women there, perhaps, that people may not know of it. This is the leaning forward that you yes, were talking about really earlier. It's, yeah. it's about being a bit more I assertive. Think, uh, you know, when, when in the Institute, I kept, sorry to keep going back to our wonderful Institute, but we, we actually train people in uh, 
in, uh, in media training, for example, being more assertive, being able to ask questions at conferences and to, to give a paper and, and to actually do that because then you do get chosen because you get noticed. And so I think that's really important. And women tend not to because of the male networks, but if you've got a really good woman who gives a very good presentation at an international conference, she may be asked to review the next paper for Nature. Mm. That's and the way to do it. I know myself personally, I find it really um, uncomfortable to put myself forward sometimes. But what I do is I say, okay, just suppress all those feelings and just go and do it and then I can feel bad about having done it later. <laughs> <laughs> that's the, the, the packet of Tim Tams when you get home. Yeah. So, well, you know, that's a, a woman in science sharing yeah. their secrets yeah. of success. That's my secret of success. Just no, I, I put those feelings that, away for a while. That, that is the same as I was saying about that we're brought up to say we're people persons. And, you know, there is, if we're going to have caricatures, a sort of image that we don't want to deviate from. We want to be touchy-feely, we want to be people persons, we don't want to shove ourselves forward because, you know, that's um, not a very feminine thing to do. Because uh, then you're called assertive and strident and aggressive, <laughs> and things like that. And, and at the same time, unless you do those things, and you can do it nicely, then people won't notice you and then we will have these sort of situations. We have a question uh, up here. Uh, no, sorry, over here. Oh, yep. Good afternoon, Mark Bergen from the Melbourne Design Awards. I'm interested in a values proposition uh, that seems to be coming up. I, I'm getting the impression that it's nice or it's desirable that women are in science, whereas from a marketing perspective, it's when something becomes important and is a value that the community has. That's when we see the transition take place. What do you think can be done to communicate the value of what we're missing out on because we don't have as many women in science? Well, I certainly made that point at the beginning, that I think that women do science differently and they, they ask different questions and I think they bring a richness to science and, 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 and I think that's, um, that, that might be worth sort of trying to document that a bit more in a way, I guess, because then you could market it for us. Um, but, um, and, and it is, as Susan said, you know, this wonderful individual, individual um, contribution that you make to any kind of creative activity. And um, I, I noticed this particularly because um, I have teams of people working with me who are both both genders, and the, the different, there are different contributions, and um, I think it's something that we should value. I Please. Uh, I mean, I think this is very pertinent for engineering because um, currently Australia doesn't have enough skilled engineers. We have to uh, have to bring a lot of skilled workers in from other countries, and if we had as many women doing engineering as men, then there wouldn't be that gender imbalance. But, uh, and, and I think you know, training more engineers now will mean that in 10, 20 years' time, we'll have new industries uh, because we have a greater talent pool of people starting up technology companies and uh, being able to, co to contribute to our existing companies in different ways. And maybe we're just not forward-thinking enough and we're not thinking, well, what's going to be good for us in 10, 20 years' time economically? Um, because it is a very, very pressing issue. And, um, I know that these men are all in the front row. They, they, <laughs> I've had conversations with a few of them and they all agree with me. It's all about educating the young so that we can build that foundation so that we have this huge talent pool to, to get knowledge from. Um, I don't know if anyone here is um, in the sort of um, HR sector, but certainly on British television quite recently they did some experiments showing what's the most efficient, all male teams or female teams or um, teams equal male and female, and they have little tasks like you have to build a tower with flat bits of paper and staple guns, um, <laughs> and, and this requires you to, you know, cooperate and have ideas and so on, and the tower, uh, the best tower is the one that's tallest and can support um, a glass of water or something, yeah. And very clearly, the best were 50-50, and this would be what I would say, if, you, if I was coming to you to market us, I'd say, look, yes, of course you can have all male teams, and that gets a bit testosterone rich and very aggressive and very focused, um, but not necessarily um, working as a team very well, very competitive, or you can have all women, which in my own experience, sometimes when I work with just women, can get somewhat emotional and sort of strained, <laughs> let's say, and the relationship, etc. But the together, you know, that's what I try and aim for, 50-50, has been proven in other sectors to be the most effective. It brings out the best in both genders. And I would use data like that to apply it to science. On boards, for example. Yeah. Okay, we have a question down here. Uh, Neil Byrne. Uh, amongst other things, we, we manage L'Oreal's Women in Science program in Australia. And 
what strikes me in that, what I've struck me that over the last few years, if you look at the life sciences, so women are, are doing science at university, life sciences at university, the challenges are coming when they're having kids, career break. And it's not that difficult to consider public policy options to fix that. It might be hard to get the NHMRC to do it, but you can see how you could implement policies to make that happen. It shouldn't be that difficult a problem for society. But when it comes to physical sciences, maths, physics, chemistry, engineering, girls clearly aren't doing the subjects to enable them to retain those options into university and they're not applying for university. What two or three public policy ideas do you have, if any, that could actually address that fundamental problem? Because I really don't know other than trying to run advertising campaigns. I can't think of a few simple ways of fixing that. Do you have some ideas? Science, it's a girls thing? Would that be a good starting point? <laughs> you know, I, I, I do think the idea of, of targeting um, early on and, and, and sort of training and, 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 and uh, offering girls and, and helping girls through those, you know, the secondary school to try and get them more excited about that. I mean, that's what they do with the Aboriginal stuff is to get, get people excited quite early on and, and to sort of give them the opportunities to train up. But, you know, it's a good question, Neil, because, uh, you know, it's, you've, you've, got, you've hit the nail on the head in terms of the differences. And, um, and, peop and women have been discouraged from going into the maths and, and uh, physical scientists, so sciences. So somehow it's a, how do you legislate for a culture change is, what you, is really the question. And I don't know how you do that. Marita, this is probably a good time for you to tell us a bit more detail about RoboGals. Um, well, firstly, I, I think that ads on TV um, are a good start. I mean, there's been ads on TV about getting more people into nursing, getting more people into teaching. Why not about getting more girls into engineering? Um, I think the other problem is, as Fiona mentioned, there are a lot of schools out there that I've heard <coughs> say, um, we don't encourage our students to do science. We don't encourage our students to do maths. You don't have to worry about us. Send, send your girls here. Um, <laughs> and the person who told me that story said they did not send their girl there because that's because they were from a science background. Um, and so, I mean, part, I think part of the problem is about edu education uh, as to what um, engineering careers are like. We did a study with RoboGals last year where we surveyed 350 girls. Out of those 350, only five of them knew what engineering was. Um, all these girls were between the ages of 8 and 12. Um, and so, yeah, ed education as to what these careers are would, would play an enormous role. Um, and another reason that people don't do the harder maths and the physics at, in high school, I've heard, is the schools say they're really hard subjects, don't do them. And then if, if <laughs> students don't do them, when they get to university, when they get to decide what to do for university, going into an engineering degree without physics and without the hard maths, it's hard. It's, you know, you, you need, you'd need to do a bridging course and, and get up to scratch and all of that, as opposed to learning it over the two years in year 11 and 12. So um, I, I think that having um, yeah, more incentives for all students to do physics and the harder maths um, would, would be the way to go, so that when kids are leaving high school, they have the credentials, they have the subjects to go into any field, and particularly and engineering they've got to have good, and science. They've got to have good teachers to teach it. I think that's, that's the other thing as well, isn't it? There's a, a, a young girl here with her hand up. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Oh, you got, oh, so sorry, so sorry, Susan. Yep. Yeah, my, uh, I, I've got my eye on you, don't worry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, You'll get there. OK, well, I think it's interesting if we go back to the issue of biomedical sciences not having this issue as much. Yeah? Um, first, I think um, it's really misleading um, if it's being perpetrated that the physical sciences are, quote, harder than biomedical sciences. Anyone trying to study the brain, I would defy them to say that was easy, yeah, uh, compared to, to physics and chemistry and so on, because anyway, it's all, it's all one and the same. Um, so why is, it, why is it that biomedical doesn't have the problem that the physical sciences does? And I think if we can probe and think about that, then we can tackle it. You know? And my own view is that, as I said, biomedical science is more readily, quote, all about life. You can relate it because it's on the, the same space and time scales that your body is and your, your navigation of the world is and so on. So we should therefore, if that were the case, think of ways of teaching. And this is something that's fixable, where one teaches physical sciences in a way that can relate 
to time and space scales and quote real life in a way that will be appealing to everyone. Yeah? And the way one can do that is with metaphor, one can do that with analogy, one can do it with narrative, with, with stories. May it be that biomedical science is also popular because there's soap operas on the TV concerning hospitals and so on, whereas you don't have, and wouldn't it be wonderful, the everyday story of simple lab folk, if anyone knows about the archers. You know, dun, 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 dun. Here they are in the lab, and you know, oh, I've just had my paper rejected. Oh, never mind. Oh, well, you know, and that would actually, you know, well, no, the archers, for those of you from the UK, the archers, which is, has been going since the 1940s as a radio soap opera, was introduced was introduced to inform people about sensitive agricultural issues and to subtly get them on side about Olympic, agricultural Olympic. issues. Why can't we, if there's any media people here, why can't we have a science soap opera where we have, <laughs> we we have a star female engineer you know, fighting against male chauvinism? That, that no, seriously, that, that is the way you get people Absolutely. on side by telling stories like that. Well, we've got the Big Bang Theory, but no one wants to be like Wolowitz. <laughs> Just to add to Fiona, how she said it's all about the teachers, um, there was a great study from the Grattan Institute about what's been going on in Asia, why South Korea, um, Singapore, Shanghai, Hong Kong are performing so well. And one of the things they do in South Korea, which has meant that they spend less money, but the scores of the students have improved greatly, is they, spend, they focus their money on, um, on the teachers and giving teachers PD weekly um, so that teachers can learn about science and maths concepts and um, you know, the more they learn about it, then the more they'll relate to it, the more passionate they'll be and the more they can relay that passion onto their students. It comes back really uh, to the, the Jesuit thing about give me a, a child to less seven and I'll give you a, a person for life. So in terms of policy, let's put more money into yeah. teachers' PD. True, true. Shall we, uh, do we, do we had the question from this, this lass here and then we'll... There's a lady here. So, 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 sorry, which one? What, what? I was pointing to the young girl here, but the other lady, you have had your yeah, hand up a long time. And then we'll, we'll but get I thought, you next. here's a budding okay. scientist and I want to yep. nurture her. Um, your question, please. Hi, my name is Sophia. I'm a grade five student and I'm 11, so I guess I'd be one of the young girls you're talking about. Um, I go to a lot of science lectures with my mum a lot and also to Rover Girls. <laughs> I've been to that. Um, and... Well, because, yeah, there, is, there isn't really any science and mathematics, good science and mathematics teaching in primary schools. Um, with mathematics, there's also the uh, stereotype that, you know, maths is hard, I don't like maths. And so I just like, it kind of in relation to that, I'd like to ask you, um, well, in... in in Australia and other countries, the percentage of women in science in relation to the, quali well, the um, amount of science teaching in primary school and secondary school in those countries. Do we know any of that research as to... Well, I think that Marita's touched on it a bit, and the, and the country that's really uh, doing the best in terms of science teaching now internationally is South Korea. Looking at the OECD data on education, educational outcomes, then those countries, uh, South Korea, some of the countries that you mentioned are doing, are doing better, and, and uh, I'm not quite sure. I, don't, I haven't seen the Chinese data in there, but certainly South Korea's um, doing, doing very well, and the investment they've made is in the kind of things. But, you know, wouldn't it be great if we had more women and men teaching maths and science in primary school that made it fun? And, you know, now I've got grandchildren and taking them to places, you know, like SciTex and Science Works and everything, it can be fun and it can be really fun. I mean, it's, I'm finding I'm learning, I'm learning from some of these things as well. So I think you're abs you've absolutely put a very good point to us that if we want to really make a difference, we've got to start very young, exciting people, and we've got to get rid of this thing that maths is hard and boring because it's not and it's very exciting. And so that means getting us excited about it too. Um, so that we can help our kids and grandkids with the homework and other things they have to do. But, you know, I think it's, it, it's, it's really changing that cultural thing about it being a, a hard thing to do, which Susan's already and, and Marita have already commented on. But yes. very good comment. Yeah. Um, Do you want to go, Sam? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, I think you've raised a really good point, actually. Okay. Um, and it's good to hear that you've been involved in Rotary Girls. Um, yeah, I've spoken to education experts and, and they tell me the particular focus that is needed is on science in primary schools 
because that, it, it's sorely lacking there. Um, I don't know what to do about it, but it, yeah, you have stated what, what so. Um, the other thing that you spoke about is that you go to a lot of science lectures and um, a lot of science-related places, and I think that's fantastic, and that you're very, very lucky. And I think you highlighted another really good point, which is that parents have as much to do with getting kids into science and nurturing kids as teachers, and so we shouldn't all be pointing the finger at just, just teachers, yeah. but, but saying, well, what can we do as parents in order to uh, help our kids and educate our kids and broaden their minds? Because um, you're only at school for six hours of the day, and the, the other 18, you're at home with your parents. Okay, or, okay. Yeah. quickly, Susan. Yeah, uh, quickly, I think, Fiona. I think the key to everything is inspirational teaching. Yeah. And so, um, Everyone remembers a good teacher. I'm sure everyone in this room probably chose the subject they did at school or the speciality because their teacher was just great. They got on really well with them. Now, how do we get that at this level? Um, equal gender representation and also teaching science. One possibility is there's a brilliant scheme started in the States called Teach First. I don't know if that happens here. Yeah, it's Teach for Australia. Yeah, OK. So Teach First is where you take absolutely stellar um, graduates who've just got a first, who've just left university, and they spend, say, two years before they embark on their career, they go, yeah, they go into a school and they teach. So they're bringing a real fresh approach. They're bringing um, a new face, a young face into the science. Let's hope it's equally gender matched. That's one, that's one possibility. Um, another way, of course, is the RI, plugging the RI. Australia, because we had a meeting today, the RI is absolutely behind teachers. They want to empower them, support them, help them, invigorate them. And so, you know, look here <laughs> to, to help for teachers. Fiona. Well, what we haven't talked about is that there's the internet and how powerful the internet can be to both help teachers and students. And I was up in the remote Aboriginal community of Warman, um, which is Turkey Creek, um, where Queenie Mackenzie and Robert Thomas came from, famous painters. And I was talking to the kids about science. These are the kids in secondary school at Warman, and it is a very remote Aboriginal community. And I was walking around the classroom after giving my talk, and there were all these kids on the computer doing Math Olympics. Get it, and they wanted to get 100%. I mean, the boys wanted to get 100% because then they could get and go play football. Um, and they could only play football if they'd got 100% in their Math Olympics. But I just thought, what a fantastic thing this was for these kids in this remote community. The teachers were not, you know, that 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 good at teaching maths up there, but this using the internet was, was actually um, a really quite powerful. Um, so I think that that's a, um, right. and, and the other is the Academy of Science, which is run, of course, um, Primary Connections, which is their scientific thing, which of course got cut, should never have cut something as important as the teaching of science in primary schools, which enables teachers to be better teachers of science at that primary level. What we're talking about here though is what, Sophie, is it Sophie? Is really sort of, the, is, you really have to start young. And I think that's a really important point. I would like to quickly run around the question of how do we promote and get more teachers of science in primary schools to start the process at that end. Have we got any ideas on the panel? Well, I, I do think we have to look at France. Because, you know, the, what France does is to understand that brain development is occurring early and that the best investment you can make is early. And so a lot of the teachers that are in the French system, the most highly qualified teachers, are the ones in the early years and, and in the primary schools. And so they put a lot of effort into high-quality educational environments earlier. And I think that that's exactly what you're saying. In other words, we need to value primary school teachers and early childhood educators above all the other groups because they're the ones who are going to really make the biggest difference and the earlier you can do it the better. So it is a po that's a policy, not Neil, that we can bring in, that we would actually in, 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 enhance the career trajectories and pay more and value more uh, the teachers in the primary school system. Marita? Um, Major oh, culture change. I don't have anything to add on. Nothing teachers. to add there, but Susan? Well, again, I say it's a complex situation. There's no simple answer. I mean, obvious things are... Uh, the higher the pay and the higher the status, then the more attractive yeah. for many people, especially, dare I say it, for men, um, the, job, the job will be. Yeah. Um, but I think really what we ought to be asking is how, what we're actually teaching, not just the recruitment of the teachers, but um, how we're going to convey to girls, especially the excitement of science, the idea of an experiment and testing something out when you don't know the answer. That's the real... That's the real thrill. So there's, there's very many factors, and perhaps we should have another session on, on teaching in science. Yeah. Uh, yeah?
Yeah, uh, because clearly there's a lot of factors, and it yeah. would not be doing it justice to do some kind of quick soundbite. But I think, um, again, getting people uh, like Teach First to come, um, having uh, much more promotion in the media about this, perhaps profiles of teacher in the media, that's a very good way of getting people interested and aware and alert to those kinds of careers. There's a whole raft of possibilities, but, um, you know, uh, we're out of time now, but let's have another session on that. Just on, um, tangentially to that as well, I think if you want to introduce young kids to new ideas, and especially in the science area, if the teacher doesn't feel like they're capable, um, getting outreach programs in, um, there's a lot of science well, out yeah. and engineering outreach programs out there, Robo Gals well, being one of them. One, no, one, um, one so very we, suitable to, to yeah. um, primary school kids. Yeah, one thing we did in Adelaide, and I think that's gone national, Linda, has it now? Yeah, was to get graduates in labs young graduates who were doing research and twin them with schools so that they could go and visit mm. their twin school. And they would go from time to time and give talks and, and so on, and the older kids, in theory, could go to the lab, you know, in the holidays. And this is a way of uh, personalising science and also very good for the graduates because it gave them communication skills that perhaps they wouldn't have in the sort of narrow remit of the lab. So I don't know um, how much that was rolled out, but it was. It was called the twinning scheme at the time. Um, Linda Cooper down the front would know probably what's happened to it. Um, and I'm sure others would just... Scientists in schools, it's called. Yeah. There we are. And Robo Girls was founded from a That's scientist right. in schools. And Robo Girls, yes. Look, no, 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 it was actually founded as a result of scientists in schools. Oh, there we are. Right. So it all happened in Adelaide first. Yeah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we've had an abundance, a tsunami of wonderful ideas this evening. It wouldn't have been such an entertaining discussion if it weren't for my three brilliant panellists. Would you please thank Susan Greenfield, <laughs> Mareta Chang, and Fiona Stanley.